Can we can we check the mic? One, two, one, two. Can you all hear me? All right. So thanks for coming. This is the School for Poetic Computation. Um, we are so excited that you are here. Um, I just want to say a few things. We are located at the West Bath uh, Artist Housing, which is the historic landmark that is a home for many artists and also studios. So we are in residence of West Bath, and we're always happy to share that story because the West Bath used to be home of the Bell Labs, which is a research and development uh, facility of that corporation. And important things have happened here, such as like the presentation of the first NPN transistor, and uh, remarkable people have worked here, like Claude Shannon of the Information Theory, and also Bell. Um, Bell was a home for Alan Turing for a few months when he was in research uh, residency here in the United States. And since then, it's been a home for many innovative artists. And I think specifically, we're interested in the history of like alternative schools and fl um, fluxes and experiments in art and technology. All these things that have been fundamental for us thinking about the uh, art and technology and poetics. And that is just an acknowledgement to say that we're not the first to do this and we're definitely not going to be the last. And to do that, to explore the intersection of poetics and coding, we are trying this school. It's called a School for Poetic Computation. And we're launching the uh, spring cohort for 2019. And a group of students work with the faculty and teaching assistants. And I think I want to say a briefly about like how we select the students. So it's um, we get up applicants from around the world and there's a selection committee that's comprised of the alumni and teachers. And this year we were happy to work with Galen McDonald, Neda Bomani, Susie Fu, who were the students from the previous session, and Sam Levine, who teaches here, who's actually in the audience, and Golan Levin, who is uh, uh, our advisor and a friend. And my name is Taeyun Choi, and I'm a co-founder of the school, and I oversee the admissions process too. And what we look at for the applicants is um, their excitement about the potentials of working with technology. And we also look at their work history engineer or designers, but we really look at their story and like what brought them here. What, what, why are they curious to come here out of all the places? And it's this question that drives them to explore the poetic computation for the next 10 weeks. And we're, we're induced and we're inspired by their, um, their ideas. So that's the introduction. The restroom is on the hallway. If you just want to go around the left, you can always use a restroom. And um, the, each talk will be four minutes. And um, we've asked students to talk about their background and their ideas for the SFPC. And we won't have a ha chance to have a Q&A. You can talk to them all afterwards. And yeah, I think I'll just say, who can you raise your hand if you're an alumni of SFPC? Great, thanks for coming back. Um, it's always good to see you. And um, I really appreciate you being here. And um, I think on that note, we will kick off to Alex. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Alexander Miller, or you can call me Alex. And I am part of an artistic duo called Space Filler with my creative partner, who's also named Alex, Alex Nagy. And I'm going to present our work in video form, and I'm just going to talk really fast over the video. It's going to be just like kind of a machine gun approach. So let's see if this works. OK, this is visuals we did for Jimmy Kimmel, for a performance on Jimmy Kimmel, music visuals. This is an installation that is a generative simulated ecosystem on the side of an apartment building. This is a shoe pedestal installation for a shoe store. You pick up the shoe and the platform reacts to you picking up the shoe. This is an interactive particle system using a connect. Uh, here we have an LED sculpture using ping pong balls. We really like using ping pong balls. This is an audio visual installation. Uh, the music is generated live. This is something we did for a rave, uh, projected laser cut shapes. Here's another ping pong ball installation. Ping pong balls are really cheap. That's why we, why we like them. Uh, here's something we did with a friend that is a play on the transition between order and chaos. We're really interested in that idea. Um, and this piece is kind of also playing off that, where the user can turn knobs and interact with systems that kind of have this transition from order to chaos. 
Uh, in this piece, the viewer can manipulate a physical cube and then the projection reacts to their manipulation and we showed it at a park in Seattle. It was really fun. Uh, here is me VJing. So these are uh, live generated visuals at an art gallery in Seattle. And finally, these are some projection mapped cacti at a conservatory where the viewer can manipulate the, the cacti by spinning like an arcade trackball. Whew, okay, that was a lot. Uh, so that's kind of what I do uh, uh, as space filler. That's my background. I'm really interested in emergent systems, uh, the transition or the boundary between order and chaos, and math mathematical models of nature. But I'd also like to talk about one other piece, which is kind of separate from those, and which actually I think is maybe more aligned with what I want to explore at SFPC. Is somebody timing me, by the way? Is that? Do we? OK, cool. Just want to make sure. Uh, so uh, this is something that I made called NaggyLive.com. So as I said, my collaborator's name is Alex Nagy. And he infamously uh, never had any social media accounts, never had a Facebook or Instagram. And his friends wanted to keep up with him to see what he was doing. So I created this site. There's a phone number on the bottom of the screen right here. And if you text that phone number an image, it uploads it to the site. And if somebody else texts another photo to, to the, that number, it will replace the old image. And the images aren't archived. There's no way to see past images. So they kind of have this temporary uh, ephemeral quality, which actually really encourages people to you know, post silly images. And this was not, I did not consider this to be an art piece at all when I made it. This was like a joke that I made to kind of make fun of him. Um, but it ended up having this really interesting effect where all, all of his friends in Seattle started taking pictures of him and posting them to the site. And it would be this sort of thing where like, you know, multiple times a day, you'd check to see, well, where is Alex Nagy now? And, you know, you keep up with him. It was really awesome. And it kind of like a community sprung up around this site, which is so weird. So I, I, I definitely didn't think about it as an art piece. And it's for sure an invasion of his privacy. We took it down after a year because of that. Uh, but I, it was really fun to, to, to work on this. And I kind of want to explore things like this in the future. Uh, so that's me. I'm Alex Miller. If you want to follow my work um, as Space Filler, you can follow me on Instagram. Here's our website. And thank you so much. Excited to be here. Yeah, I will. Okay. Hi. Um, my name is Ariel. I'm a media artist and educator from Bariloche, which is a very beautiful small city in the south of Argentina. This is Bariloche. Uh, but for all its natural beauty, um, our society is quite unjust. I would say the entire country's society is quite unjust, especially regarding opportunities for education. So I try to find ways to fight this. So I teach, I work as a teacher at a small public art school, which is free for people to attend. and. Um, yeah. So I teach different workshops here, like a workshop for little kids to make video games or a media arts workshop where I help people make their first interactive works. And I, I like this job. I like teaching. So when I began my practice, my artistic pra practice, when I was in university, um, I worried a lot about surveillance and I made some stuff regarding surveillance, and we can talk about this later. Uh, but recent political shifts in Argentina kind of changed my interest towards more like visceral subjects. So I'd like to share with you um, an installation that I made recently. And this installation is about death and social memory. And it's you go into a room and there's a wall that's covered with blank postcards and the postcards are painted with a phosphorescent pigment. They're completely painted. And you see this projection that looks like noise, right? And what happens over time is that images start emerging from the postcards, like glowing images. There are these. And these are portraits of people that have died in the last 28 years, which is my life, uh, at the hands of our government one way or the other. And these are only the people that I remember. So they're like my dead people. I consider them my dead people. And the thing is, you can take the postcards with you. 
but because they are um, just the remnant of light hitting this glowing pigment, they're really fragile. And in order to preserve this memory, you have to take very good care of this postcard. Like you have to keep it close to your body and cover it and like really look after it to have the portrait survive. And even then it fades. So I think of this as a way of like sharing the responsibility of keeping these people's memory alive. So making um, art about this kind of stuff, I find is painful and difficult. So I think collaboration, especially collaboration with people who are very caring, is important for me. And this is a, these images are from another project about um, yeah, finding like shelter and support in somebody else. Another thing that I, I would say I worry about is how to make stuff that uh, has like a real social impact on people, how to, you know, help people. And this is a, a little project that I finished with a friend just before I came here, actually. And so in Bariloche, you can wait for the bus forever. Like, it can take forever. And it's usually cold and miserable. So we made this thing, which is just a really simple device that's installed inside a bus station, like a bus stop, sorry, not a bus station. And this is going to be loud, I think. It plays poems or stories for people that wait for the bus. That's all it does. But it, it makes the act of waiting, you know, a little bit more bearable. This is a poem by Nicolas Hichen, who is an incredible Cuban poet. So, yeah, um, I guess I came to SFPC to learn and advance my practice, but what I'm most interested in is meeting and working with interested people. So if any of the things that I mentioned resonate with you somehow, I'd really like to meet you. So this is my contact information and I'll be here. Thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Bomani Oseni McClendon. Uh, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, uh, but I live in Brooklyn, New York now, uh, where I've been living for about the past two years. And so today to sort of explain a bit about my background and why I'm here, I'm going to uh, just give a couple of anecdotes that I think maybe can help frame that out. So uh, on August 9th, uh, Michael Brown was shot and killed in Ferguson, Missouri. And on August 11th, I sent this email to my manager um, that basically just reads, hello, I would like to use my sick hours for today. Uh, at the time, I was doing my first real engineering job as a electronics prototyping intern at a defense and aerospace company. And I was actually living in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, I learned that uh, Michael Brown was shot and killed uh, not too far away from where I was living. Uh, even though I told my manager that I was sick that day, I actually spent my time that day uh, engaging in some of the protests. And throughout the few months that I was there, I heard people in the community say things like, hands up, don't shoot. Uh, but I wasn't so lucky while I was at my workplace. Uh, there I'd hear people say things like, uh, black people are barbaric. And it really bothered me because I was working with people who, you know, make spacecraft weapons, uh, who have security clearances that give them access to some of the U.S.'s most uh, secret information. And uh, I felt a bit concerned that people would feel so open about speaking in that way in a workplace. So I actually left uh, my internship a few weeks early. Um, and uh, what I realized during that experience um, and what has become clear through most of my professional experiences as a software engineer uh, is that the gap in class and ideology between people who shape technology and the communities affected by it is really wide. Uh, I think probably to this audience, like that's not news, but at the time I was 19 and I really uh, remember feeling really confused and, and pretty surprised by this. So part of why I'm here at SFPC is to experience being a part of the community of practice around technology that uh, has a basis in care and critical theory. And I think that'll be a really great learning experience for me uh, to carry forward in the future. I mentioned that I was a prototyping intern and prototyping actually continues to be like one of the things that I spend most of my time doing. These are a few prototypes from recent years. It's like a interface to help people learn uh, how to draw mathematical relations 
like a way of showing uh, vulnerability in public spaces. On the far side over there is a different way of visualizing code. Here's like a synth controller with a bike wheel. Uh, this is from like DJing and, and DJing and stuff around the city. And then uh, this is like this uh, game that I made to allow uh, kids to contribute to urban space planning. Uh, so a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, even the most like real art project that I have contributed software for uh, kind of started as an experiment in, in using like modern web technologies to to make a, a, a you know electromechanical installation uh, I wrote it with node and I changed it later on <laughs> but uh, yeah all this stuff is is experimentation I would actually consider myself to be a chronic prototyper it's like kind of a love-hate relationship I treat a lot of things that I do as as an experiment um, but my relationship with experimentation recently changed um, my father has been battling a type of cancer called multiple myeloma for about the last four years and last year in October, I spent uh, about six weeks in Nashville with him uh, as he began a new experimental treatment as part of a phase two clinical study. And uh, in reflection on that experience, there are a couple of relevant takeaways. Uh, the first is that experiencing my father's, you know, accelerating drive to pursue his creative passions uh, is actually what motivated me to apply to SFPC and then quit my job a couple weeks ago to come do this. Uh, but furthermore, it got me thinking about experimentation in a totally new life light. Being able to experience uh, hospital visits with him, parse through study contracts, research documents, and talk to doctors and research nurses was really influential. Uh, but most importantly, I was influenced by the discussions that we had about his concerns with the medical system overall. And uh, as I started to do more research about the foundation of those concerns, I really started to understand the history of malpractice against black patients uh, in medical experimentation. Uh, so to kind of continue that research, uh, some of the things I've been doing are reading books like this one, Medical Apartheid, which really makes clear that uh, black people and then quite literally black bodies or, or black body parts have been used sort of as clinical material in, in really grotesque and inhumane ways. Um, so uh, here at SFPC, I'm kind of excited to explore that a little bit either here or you know afterwards um, but I'll end there and say thanks you should talk to all the really cool students uh, that are here because they're super sick and should convince them to be my friend <laughs> thanks <laughs> hello um Oh, fantastic. Uh, this screen uh, brings me back to the 1990s. Uh, thanks to Jonathan Day and an SUPC teacher for the, and no, sorry, that's the wrong direction. There we go. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. okay, here we go. Oh, uh, there we go. Um, so yeah, so I started programming around that time and um, I was using a HyperCard, which is an extraordinary uh, environment that has a very uh, flexible and user uh, modifiable uh, interface. Um, you can sort of reveal information and change it, and it's extraordinarily uh, rich. Uh, this GIF is also my way of telling you that I'm a clown, but you already got that. Um, on the figure on the right is uh, uh, something from my master's thesis. Um, I was working on a, in a neuro in neuroscience research lab and uh, using computer vision to stabilize uh, images. Uh, I applied some of that uh, at a contest uh, at the National Institutes uh, of Health uh, to build an app that would allow people to uh, snap a picture of their pill and to tell them what pill they were about to consume or, or not consume if it wasn't the right pill. Um, this is also a, a project. I'm sorry that I jumped right into it. It seems very, sorry. I was thinking I had a better pace, but I'll relax a little bit like this. This is much more relaxed. <laughs> yes. Sorry, everybody was so cool and I'm like so straight. So yeah, this is a project with, uh, by Adam Bizanta. Uh This was an installation in Montreal, where I'm from, I should have said that at the beginning, uh, that generated random art pieces such as those that you can see here. And as part of this installation, I created code, machine learning code, that um, matched images uh, and um, titled images by the similarity to existing real art uh, pieces that were shown at the MoMA, the Guggenheim. Um, this is a photo of uh, uh, somebody at the, from the United States uh, Coast Guard. Um, they're using a map that I created two years ago during Hurricane Harvey. Uh, the map was used to dispatch helicopter missions and it helped rescue 1,700 people. Uh, it was used again during Hurricane uh, Florence and Michael. Uh, there's an immense number of things that I'd love to talk about, but maybe after. Um, 
Uh, this is uh, Elvis Presley, or rather animatronic Elvis. Um, I, you could buy this and have it at your house and it would sing and do uh, facial expressions. Um, I modified it a little bit and um, I made it into an arcade machine that would do uh, absurd fortune telling for a dollar. Um, I was probably trying to automate my irreverent clowning uh, spirit, uh, which thank thankfully I grew out of. And I was supposed to do a joke and go like this. And you'd understand I didn't grow out of it, but the joke seems completely flat now, especially because I explained it. Um, this is, um, so So that was the past. This was the past. But uh, looking forward, um, I just want to show you a couple of things that completely resonate uh, with me. Um, this on the left is, uh, was built by uh, Patricio Gonzalez Vivo and Jan Lo, who are SFPC teachers. Um, this is a book of shaders, uh, which is an extraordinary expression of uh, user interface empathy towards students who are learning to program. Uh, it's an absolute gem. I'd love to talk about it for 10 hours, so spare yourself and just go see it. Um, on the right, uh, this is a piece by W. Bradford Paley, uh, Paley who, that's on display at the Whitney. Um, it's a representation of code and execution. Uh, which is absolutely incredible, and a security guard asked me to to move away, and I really couldn't. Uh, it's it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, this is Dynamic Land, uh, which also is. So but Dynamic Land by Brett Victor. Brett Victor is maybe one of the most interesting user, uh, human computer interaction uh, philosophers today. Um, this allows people to interact and compute uh, together using their senses in a sort of very um, uh, human way and go away from tapping on glass. Um, to me, the point of intuitiveness is kind of so far with this project that at some point you just stop talking about user interface. This is just life happening. Um, I also wanted to mention a short trip by uh, Alexander Pern, uh, which felt to me like a gentle, meditative, interactive illustration. Uh, it sort of feels like a game, but it isn't, and it looks like an illustration, and it is, but it isn't. Um, it's a wonderful micro world, and it creates warmth, the warmth of a warm fireplace on a cold Montreal night. Um, warmth, gentleness, and care are uh, important, not only for me, for you too, of course, um, but I still wanted to say it out loud. Um, this is an idea based on a chip uh, that actually would allow to create uh, an inexpensive mobile phone uh, text based which which have infinite battery life and which would have gps and calls and everything you kind of want in a phone in a way and a super lo-fi uh, camera um, i kind of think that maybe a small fast reliable portable text interface would bring up a number of possibilities kind of like a portable terminal this is just a prototype idea um, and finally maps uh, mapping has mapping has always been very uh, important for me and I, I've, I've done a, a quite a few quite a few projects but I still feel like something to uh, store and share uh, recommendations and geographic notes to yourself which is what I have uh, here in New York and elsewhere in the world would be just absolutely fantastic there's a million things I'd like to do with them and uh, that's all folks and I have a gag coming up so there we go thank you <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Javier. I'm from Bariloche, Argentina. I'm from the same town as Ariel, and we didn't know each other before SFPC, which is quite amazing. And well, uh, after finishing high school, I moved to Buenos Aires to study image and sound design at the Buenos Aires University. Um, among lots of things, it's kind of a film school, a film school but w with an important design approach. Um, for my final project at university, I did a work where I rescued a decaying 16mm film from my grandfather from 1938 and made a video installation. The images of his journey to the south of the continent were completely lost as the film suffered from something called vinegar syndrome, a kind of disease acetate films have after a couple of years. So this was the result of the actual scanning of each 16mm film. And this was my first approach towards new media, as for the installation I made a custom screen with fans that would make the screen move while the film was being displayed, trying to emulate the already existent movement of the film. A 
After this work, I got a job at the Buenos Aires Film Museum, where I'm still working today. In this place, we do restoration and preservation of films and video, and we take care of the equipment required to reproduce them. Um, after finishing image and sound design, I started a master's degree in electronic arts, where I learned code and electronics. These are a few projects I've been working on. This was a video game inspired by Mars images from the 60s. You had to land on a planet and con control a rover with the help of a monitor and a joystick, and the signal appeared distorted thanks to a CCTV wireless system. I also made a series of digital and analog lo-fi devices exploring interaction and interfaces. Right now, I'm designing an old school 2D platform video game with a friend, who is an illustrator, where all the graphics are going to be printed in risography. Um, I'm very excited about general media genealogy and how we experiment with analog and digital tools to express feelings and emotions. I'm sorry, I think I'm feeling a slide here. Mm, yes, I'm going to tell you orally. Uh, I was also involved in education last year, and um, we did a series of workshops in high schools uh, building um, MIDI controllers on cardboards and cardboard boxes and it was a very edifying experience because all the students were from very diverse backgrounds uh, well I was telling you this I'm now designing an old school 2d platform video game with a friend and while at SFPC I'd like to explore new ways of expressing myself through technology and without it as well so uh, thank you very much you can contact me here Oh, and I guess I think this student has a video. They're a remote student, so let me just play the video. Cool. Hi, my name is uh, Joseph Wilk. Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm not physically with you in the space, but virtually. Um, so I'm one of the first students to be trying to work through um, the course remotely. Um, working supported by the WIT Foundation, um, set up by the Disabled List, um, incorporating disabled people into the design process rather than designing for them. Uh, working with the school, the TAs, the teachers to see how we can make this course um, just more accessible. Uh, and from my own perspective personally, I've watched from afar from the school and the work. Um, I wanted to so much be a part of it, but the realities of my world and my body just mean that that's an immense challenge. And I'm, I'm really excited that, that this kind of empowerment that I, I feel like the school is teaching uh, could, could, could to be accessed by so many more people who would benefit so, so much from the content. I'm really excited going forward how this will help. In terms of myself, I guess I'm a programmer, uh, I guess kind of like a data scientist for sound. I use code to explore novel ways of creating instruments, digital instruments. Uh, and I also work with um, composers for movie and TV, uh, creating, I guess, compositional aids uh, and ways of augmenting the creative process in, in creating music. I also work um, as for the Raspberry Pi Foundation, um, helping teach children computer science. And um, also, I work as a performance artist. I go under the name of Repla Electric, where I perform the live coding of music and visuals. Um, so I'm writing code live to an audience, controlling um, Unity 3D and uh, Sonic Pi Super Collider uh, kind of musical tools. Um, here's a brief, brief snippet of uh, some of the work I've done.
and in terms of what I'm most excited about at the moment. So uh, code for me is really uh, I strongly associated with my freedom and it's my way of exploring the world around me. And often I'm not necessarily interested in exploring the coding world. I want to use code as my way to explore other worlds. And puppetry really interests me at the moment because it's, it's this very old traditional um, performing art. Um, but it has a lot akin to how I see live coding as a performance. Uh, the puppeteer has visibility, they are visible, they can become visible, control that and add to the narrative, but they can also make themselves invisible by absorbing you in their control of a, of a narrative through a puppet. And I see something really interesting in that when I'm live coding for an audience, I also have that presence and I'm giving a narrative and a story through my thoughts and my code. I feel like there's something very interesting to explore there that I would love to delve deeper into. In terms of what I want to do with my time at the school, um, I, I guess I guess I'm, I'm still I'm still discovering that. As I said, I, I really so strongly associate programming with my sense of freedom and control. It's something I don't necessarily have in my real world, but my programming gives me this freedom. I'm really interested in better understanding that and trying to think of a way of conveying that in a meaningful way that's can wider reach, uh, wider reach people to kind of capture what it is that code gives people as an empowerment. Um, as a disabled person, I also really interested how code can be used as a lens to explore the world from a disabled perspective um, and also challenge some of the precepts around disability, uh, specifically around automation. So code is um, often best realized in automation in, in our world. And that has a huge impact on the environment and that environment defines whether you feel disabled or not. So I'm very interested in how I can kind of incorporate um, my work as uh, live coding and uh, performance uh, into challenging some of the ideas and exploring how code is empowerment and how so how it uh, challenges the environments and, and explores the environments that we exist and live in. So thank you so much for letting me be a part of this space. I'm, I'm really sad I can't physically be there, but it, it means so much just to, just to get the chance to, to participate. So thank you. And you're doing the keynote, right? Yes. This is, okay, cool. Um, I think it should just work. Yeah. Ooh, All right. Um, wow, uh, this is going to be very challenging. I f wish I would have started. Um, I'm going to get a little lo-fi here, OK? Um, this is me on the right side of the screen. I think this was potentially my first job, uh, not uh, as a superhero, but as a younger uh, brother. I'm originally from Ecuador, um, was born and raised in Ecuador. I moved to the US when I was 20 years old. So uh, I think that makes me an immigrant and I'm proud of it. Um, I'm gonna stay there for a second. Um, I studied graphic design and worked as a designer in, in North Carolina for uh, nine years before moving to New York. And at this point, I'm comfortable saying that I struggle with an addiction to a salary until I was almost 29. And I don't mean this in a judgmental way, but I, for a while, had this urge to explore myself as an artist without answering to a creative brief. So I waited until I was almost 29 to, to take the leap, uh, which was roughly in 2000, end of 2010. Uh, no plan, just uh, hopes to find a voice, find myself and... Uh, find the work that meant uh, more to me than uh, just a paycheck. And that first project, after I uh, quit or cut ties with a, an employer, uh, was a passion project. Uh, is a concert film slash documentary about a band from Venezuela that I had the uh, honor, pleasure to, to be on tour with. I'm, I'm a drummer. I've been in a band since I was 13 years old. Uh, they had a very unique uh, story. I'm not going to give it away, but it, it involves David Byrne. Long story short, uh, it was one of those first few um, 
film projects crowdfunded via Kickstarter, so it brought a lot of a lot of attention to the project. It was a, an avalanche of love the way this whole thing happened. Um, thankfully, David Byrne uh, accepted being interviewed to talk about his relationship uh, with the band, and that brought me to work with, with him eventually. Uh, it's been many projects uh, now, uh, but this is one that I uh, love talking about uh, because it's a true collaboration. The entire uh, album design uh, involves a lot of wonderful artists. The distortions on the faces uh, are actual uh, done with actual prosthetics. Um, Gabe Bartels is the artist who who did that. Um, Steve Powell's did the typography. Uh, I was brought in to contribute to the interior artwork. So because this beautiful objects already existed, the uh, the molds for the prosthetics um, use that to make the artwork. So yes, this could have been done in Photoshop, but we photographed the artifact, projected the work on top of the object, and that's the final result. So I, I love to, as a designer, to work uh, as far away from the computer as possible. Um, a recent design project last year, I was fortunate to work with a a small, very talented team to develop the uh, concept and, and campaign for Tribeca Film Festival. I'm very proud to say that this campaign was all done with a black and white printer and a lot of paper, which relates to the most basic thing about storytelling, which is the script. And the language, as you can probably tell, uh, takes cues from film language to serve as a call to action. Uh, even the merge came from a um, pile of paper on the floor that looked just beautiful. So a lot of ripped paper, a lot of, uh, it was very labor intensive, but um, gratifying too. Um, yeah. Um, love stop motion, love movement, love experimenting with analog uh, technologies. Um, yeah, very fun. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm a drummer. Uh, this is my band, Legs. I'm on the right. Uh, ghosted away. We're fun. Sometimes we make videos where we play invisible instruments, and I'm gonna leave it at that. We're on all the platforms if you care to take a listen. Um, on a more personal uh, level, uh, I love to experiment with uh, images and low tech. This is uh, just achieved by using a regular office scanner as a camera and finding muting that. Weird personal projects. I became obsessed with uh, cigarette butts uh, in my neighborhood. I, I live in Greenpoint and I became, or I started to um, silhouette them like dead bodies, uh, dead butts maybe, and uh, keeping count. Um, still ongoing, lots of them. Um, Okay, but in the last five years, four or five years, I finally um, was able to share this body of work that I was searching for. And it's a series of ongoing drawings, uh, site-specific installations that I call Drawing Under the Influence. Um, I discover the work as I make it. Uh, it's um, the unconscious, I think, plays a crucial role in it like a guy that reveals a road that can only be seen once it's been traveled in, in its entirety. Um, I think that sometimes to find yourself, you need to get lost first, so. For doing this work, I love to incorporate soundscapes, so this is sped up, but I often do field recordings from the locations where the work is going to be produced, and uh, I create a sort of soundscape to be influenced by uh, to execute this work. Um, I like to think that I'm drawing with people, not for people, and connecting with other humans through art. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Thank you very much. That's my work. Okay. Give me just a second here. Uh, here we go. That's what I'm, yeah, I'm going to refresh. Yeah. 
Thanks. So um, for students, the order has shifted a little bit. So next is Melissa, and then Yen, and we have Luisa, and then we'll continue. We just have to shuffle the slides a little bit. And no, that's not right. Come on. Take it out of full screen first. Cool. Oops. No. Do you have notes, Melissa? No. Okay. Does any do any other students have notes as part of their Google Slides? Okay. Well, then let's we'll, we'll try to get this fixed right now. Sorry. Uh, am I just like not clicking on the arrow? Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Isn't this fun? This is so fun. Okay. We're good. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Hi, I'm Melissa Holmes. Um, let's see. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, but I've been living in Atlanta for about eight years. I have a background in computer science and software engineering, and I've been working as a web developer for the past few years. The um, uh, reason why I waited to switch slides is because the next one is really distracting. Um, these are my two cats. Um, they're, very, they're fairly popular online, like more than more than me and um and they're my cats are cousins um they're best friends and as you can see they're both like very involved in uh, my creative process and my programming <laughs> um so what i wanted to talk about was um what what i want to talk about is um what i've been doing with my art and how i want it to change as while i'm here so I've been working on programming, and in parallel, I've been working on my art, and I haven't really brought them together. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this program was so that I can um, take what I've learned and um, figure out how to explore the same themes um, electronically or with uh, robotics or electronics or things like that. So I'm going to start with t um, going through some things I've done, and these are actually um, uh, some of the things that I know how to do, but I actually do more. So um, I really like to figure out how to make things work and the processes and techniques that go behind craft. And uh, the more technical and difficult, the more interesting it is to me. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about is travel sketching and can be called urban sketching or, um, you know, it, if it's an urban environment. And this is a sketch I did right after I got here. I went and got coffee and I sat and I drew this and these people were sitting there and I don't think they noticed me. <laughs> but um, this is kind of interesting because you go to a place and then you kind of look for something interesting and then try to record it. And so I've gone to... Um, um, they're not necessarily in urban environments, but it kind of um, forces you to really like observe something where you are and not just worry or think about other stuff. So um, this is kind of capturing a moment in time, but it to me it's more personal than taking a picture. Um, this is ink drawing. Um, this is something I've been practicing. I have a, a mentor who's a comic book artist. And uh, one of the things that he's teaching me is to um, figure out like the size and shape of what you want to draw. But then you get out the ink and you just do it right on the first try, which is not really, um, not really easy at all. This is one of the better pieces that I've done. Um, there are a ton of that I really don't like. But it's interesting to me because it, you have to be very deliberate and confident and you have to um, kind of just trust yourself. So um, that's something that I like. Uh, one 
thing that I have to deal with is overworking things, like not knowing when it's done, not knowing when it's right, and constantly correcting it. And with this process, you can't. You, um, you only work in black and white, and you put ink on the paper, and then you're done. So um, very fun, kind of. It's high stakes, even though you know, I don't show most of them to people. Um, I also do watercolor painting. I haven't been doing as much lately, but um, I was taking classes last year, and this is something that I did in class. Um, watercolor is interesting because you put the paint on the paper and it usually doesn't do what you want it to do. So um, it kind of in the same vein of uh, you know overworking things, you can't really correct. It looks much worse if you try to correct it and go over it. And the, the most beautiful watercolor paintings um, were done with very few um, strokes of the brush. It's just like it happened to flow into the ideal arrangement. And um, so that's like kind of chaotic. And I think that's good for me to explore as well. Um, I actually was, as I was improving at watercolor, I started to feel like I needed to control it more. Um, but I, I um, try not to. Okay. Um, another thing I'm doing is printmaking. Um, I have to be more distant from my drawings. This is based on a drawing I did. But then there are all these mechanical processes you have to do to get it right. Um, and then I've also done some soft circuit work. This is a bat with light up eyes. Um, just just how, how, you, how we like them. And uh, so this is interesting because you can hold it and it bends and um, you can turn it on and off. You can wear it. Um, I do miniature painting, so you have to kind of scale things down and be very detail-oriented. And then I also draw from live models. So I look and see what they're doing and I have to make a decision about what I want to capture. Um, so uh, I want to Keep with these idea. Keep studying these ideas. Figure out how to use computers and um, uh, make art. And then um, that's it. So ask me about anything afterwards. Definitely. Can I move the mouse to the screen? Or, uh, yeah. or I just need to control the video in there? So just. Oh, thank you. Yeah, definitely. Hi, my name is Yehan. Uh, this is the screen record of my website, and um, as you can see, I'm a graphic designer. I'm a web designer and front-end developer, and I do animation as well, too. And I first want to share the work that I have done so far. So, where is my mouse? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is an ORGD that I that I work with ORG, the Open Recent Graphic Design Festival that taking place in Seoul every year. And since the festival is about like a recent graphic designers and archiving their works, so I made a website which archive itself as well. So as you can see, like it captures the right side of the website and archive them on the left side every three seconds. And if you um where's the and if you click one of them, then you return to the recent state, which is literally open recent. It's a website. And this is the website that I work with, Typo Janchi, which is the typography biennial taking place in Seoul as well. And for this website, I archived the like a CSS rules that are used to make a responsible website and adapted each, applied each rules in each squares in there. So like in, in certain ratio, the website looks like a general website, but if you change the screen size or screen ratio, then it changes like a differently. So it looks like a scattered.
Uh, Chase and Runner is the website that inverts the perspective depending on the device that you are using to enter the website. So for example, if you enter this website using desktop, laptop, then you are becoming a chaser. And for chaser's point of view, you get the 12 different street view on the bottom, which is watching the center mark as the graph you see on the bottom, like watching at the center mark. And if you enter the website, do the mobile, then you are becoming a runner. And then you get the one street view image that is 20 kilometers away from your, where you are in, from the direction that you're facing as, as a runner. Yeah, this is what I do. Like I love working with experimental website, but like making it meaningful and functional is very important for me. It's a website that I work with Lima, a media art museum in Amsterdam which is working as a general website, but you can rotate it and see the behind story of this website. And this website has this sort of like, um, like a media gallery, which is as if they are projected on the ready-made website structure. And this is the site map of this website, which I really like. And like a summer school website, which taking place in Italy. And I sometimes do animation as, as well too. This is the animation that I made for the most beautiful Swiss books in Zurich, Switzerland. And since I'm a graphic designer, I love to make posters. And I make this sort of like an interactive poster using mobile web and like making a bunch of these posters and sometimes sell them, sometimes do the show with them. Yeah, this is almost all. Yeah, I'm a graphic designer. I love with working with concept and making a concept and visualizing it is just what I really love to do. And um, yeah, this is all. I just love working with this kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm so glad that I'm in SFPC and looking forward. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is Luisa. Uh, I'm impressed that from the presentation I saw before. So I'll try to give my best. Okay, um, I guess I will tell a bit more of a uh, background story because um, it's quite influential for what I'm doing, what I did. I grew up in this town called Catanzaro in the south of Italy. Um, is anybody Italian here? No. And it, uh, the few times I met other Italians, especially outside of Italy, when I say that I come from Catanzaro, they told me, oh, it's known as the ugliest city in Italy. <laughs> and uh, you didn't know, need to know that, but it was a tough place to grow up. Um, it's a very violent place, and not as one would say because of um, strong mafia influences, but because there is such a... Um, I always felt the difference of being a woman, which, you know, I was half of the population, I was part of half of the population, but still I um, I think it left a big uh, impact on me. But then I was lucky enough to live close to very beautiful places. Um, I don't know if any of you has ever been to the Biennale di Venezia. Uh, I was there with my parents. This was I was seven years old, so... Oh some time ago, and uh, I remember it as it was an um, amusement park. It was so cool. I couldn't get the depth of it, but it felt like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Um, I s with my family, we went to many museums, but this is what really s stayed. Uh, myself, I kept on painting, on drawing, on doing a lot of stuff that got lost in time. And um, being an, an artist was not really a possibility. I needed to do a good job. I studied architecture in Rome. 
the city is amazing. I don't know if you've been there. It was one of the most lovely places where I've ever been. But studying was terrible. So you see, there's a picture of Rome, and those are the picture of my university. It was this this crazy place. I can't believe it's still like this. Uh, um, I found uh, a photographer that did a reportage. I should uh, I can share the name with you, and yeah, that's why I put the picture because I still know what I feel uh, very confused. Uh, studying architecture was interesting. I really love that I got the chance to understand how to put a design in a historical timeline that I think gives me still nowadays a lot of strength. Uh, but working as an architect, it was very frustrating for many reasons. It was not my thing. Uh, at a certain point, I discovered the Arduino. I don't remember how, but I remember I found out that this thing existed. Then I found out that I could do a workshop and I fell in love with it. And then I decided that I wanted to keep studying because I really like to do that. And I moved to Malmo, uh, which is this tiny city in front of Copenhagen. And um, it's, it's very pretty. Sweden is a strange place. It's beautiful, but uh, socially is very hard to get in contact with people. Anyway, I did this very interesting studies. Uh, after Malmo, I moved to London, I worked there for a while, and then I arrived to Hamburg, where I went back to work as an architect, uh, as an exhibition designer. And every time I told somebody I was an exhibition designer, everybody was like, oh my god, that's such a creative work. Um, I mostly felt as a plotter for somebody else. Um, my creativity was very was put in a spot and I couldn't get out of that. Um, the years from Rome until I moved to Hamburg were actually very painful. I didn't realize at the time, but um, I kept on saying, telling myself, I need to do things that are useful, that people need. And But I kept having ideas that were completely unnecessary, but just expressive. Um, I had to, I'm still doing it, come to terms with the fact that uh, that I want to be an artist. Well, I am an artist. It was a very tough thing to sell, tell to myself. And at that point, sorry if this is cheesy, but it tells a lot about me. Um, I realized that I could not do it by myself. And I started looking for an atelier. And it ended up in this amazing place. Uh, sorry. Uh, that's called the Honig Fabric, the um, uh, fabric. Uh, honey factory. Thank you. The honey. Oh, wow. I talked so much. Uh, anyway, where I have a collective. Um, and I realized that art, yeah, that's something that tells a lot about me. That um, I always feel like I'm one of the disturbed, and making art makes me feel way better. And I really like to put people, when they use something that I made, to make them feel uncomfortable. Uh, so this is a piece. Um, it's called to not, to not Disappear. It's a mirror. I always work, I often work with mirrors where people look at themselves. OK. Uh, whoa. Anyway, I had many things to say about this painting. Too many. Anyway, these are the questions I'm asking myself right now. And I think the main one is that, can we still tell all, can we still work with all themes uh, about humanities, about existing with new technologies? Hopefully. And then I'm, SP, I'm here because I'm still looking for my pack and I, I feel like I'm quite here. Thank you. Sorry for being too long. Hello, my name is Mar. Um, I did not take this, this photo was taken on a different day that I wore the same shirt because I wear uh, the same three shirts quite a lot. Uh, these are the facts. Uh, I like doing physical gestures. Uh, I don't really like language that much even though I was a linguistics major back in the day. Um, I recently celebrated my 10,000th day on earth and uh, 
I encourage everyone here to look up your 10,000th day because I would like to popularize uh, this custom. <laughs> this is uh, my favorite object. It's a small glass owl. How do I play the video? Someone, someone warned me about this. Yeah, press that play button. I had to stop recording 15 seconds in because I got uh, quite emotional. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, <laughs> this is my favorite outfit. Uh, these are some drawings I make. This one's called Skipjack. She's named after a brand of tuna. Um, this one is, well, uh, <laughs> these are two more drawings I've made. Uh, I drew this one on Halloween. I like to make uh, instructional self-defense videos, but uh, rather than tell the viewer of the video what they should do, I'm telling them what I am doing to them. <laughs> uh, I thought about showing it, but it's got some language. Um, so getting to my time uh, at SFPC, I thought I would come out swinging with my spiciest opinions because they're things I want to interrogate uh, in my art. Uh, my first opinion uh, is that there's too much information in the world and we shouldn't make anymore. <laughs> uh, and I think that context is the, op the opposite of information and that, uh, well, I want to avoid making art that is information and only make art that provides context context to pre-existing information. Uh, and I've also been thinking about what comes after the information age, and maybe it's the context age, but I can elaborate on this in person if you, or face to face if you want. Um, I think that everybody's gonna regret posting anything in 10 years. Uh, I think that the ball is already rolling in this direction. Uh, I don't think that uh, the concept of gender identity is a constructive uh, thing. Uh, but yeah, so I'm interested in what it would mean for a computer to have gender, and I have ideas about gender that I think could let a computer have gender without it being conscious first. So uh, whether or not that's a good thing is up to your interpretation. This is uh, just me having some fun. Uh, oh. This is, I don't know if I want to read this. <laughs> and I, I, I think a lot about intersubjectivity and uh, like how to adequately express what's at stake when we communicate with each other. And I think that the boundaries of the self are not within the self. <laughs> uh, I also, I forgot to boost my brand with my Instagram handle, so if you really want that, come ask me for it. <laughs> I have five more, just to give you an idea. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Khan. I Grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I've lived in New York City for the last uh, two and a half years. Um, I'm also half Pakistani. In 2016, I graduated from the Brown University Rhode Island School of Design dual degree program, um, which is a five-year undergraduate program, and it involves attending um, both schools simultaneously. And so I graduated with a BA in computer science and a BFA in furniture design. And so I started out in animation um, and electronic music. And my path through undergrad was very winding, but I will say that an especially formative class for me was uh, called Hardware Hacking for Musical Expression. 
And this was my first introduction to handmade electronics. A couple of my friends in that class were in the furniture design department, and then um, they would come to class with these like amazing containers um, for their like electronic to house their electronics, and I just wanted to be like them. Um, so I shortly thereafter um, switched my rager to furniture design. These are a few of the things that I was making while I was in the electronic music department. Um, the left is like just a. Uh, a photocell resistor matrix mapped one to one to like an LED matrix, and it's just kind of like exploring analog screen ideas. Um, yeah, move on. Um, so, uh, for the remainder of my time at school, I kept my chosen majors very separate, hoping that one day uh, I would come to a place where I could like explore their intersections more. Um, so fast forward a few years and a lot of part-time jobs later, um, I work as a sewer and tailor at a denim repair store in Greenpoint. Um, my road there was like also very winding, so if you're interested in that, um, I can answer questions. Um, but I want to take some time to talk about my personal project and why I'm here. Uh, for the past year, I've collected cotton jersey knit sweaters by the pound from local thrift stores and amassed a materials library. Um, I deconstruct the sweaters and sew them back to together to create col colorful new garments. Um, my reason for working with secondhand fabrics is more based on personal preference, although like environmental impact is like a nice bonus. Um, and uh, textiles have an almost magical ability, I believe, to like hold on to their history. And previous wear greatly improves the quality and feel and color. Um, and since my materials are limited uh, and each secondhand sweater carries its own unique history, I've turned to zero waste uh, techniques as well as experimented with my own uh, that's fine. Um, my own ideas for waste mitigation. Um, and so I'm working towards creating a system for utilizing scraps that combines computational design with vetted craft techniques. Um, and so that sort of like, long story short, um, involves like a interface maybe for like uh, designing these sweaters before I cut them out of the fabric. Um, and yeah, next steps for me uh, in August, I'll be moving to India by way of a Fulbright uh, study research grant uh, to continue studying zero waste techniques um, practiced in traditional Indian garment construction and pattern cutting at the Indus in Indian Institute for Craft and Design in Jaipur. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and thanks for having me. Hey guys, um, my name is Sheldon Chang. I'm a product designer and software engineer. Um, Comic Sans is my favorite font. Uh, so this is a cartoon that a coworker made of me once. Um, and I thought it was like maybe the best thing anyone's ever given me. Uh, so I wanted to share it with you guys. These are four cities that have played an impact on my life and I've spent a significant time amount of time in each one. Um, before coming to New York last June, I was in LA for six years. Uh, this is a dish from a restaurant in Carroll Gardens called Ugly Baby. Um, some of you may have eaten there, but it's really, really good. And um, I love eating. So I'm always looking for places that are at the intersection of ethnic, spicy, and dank. And I feel like this satisfies all those. Um, <laughs> So it's a it's turmeric sea it's sea bream which is a fish deep fried in turmeric and garlic and salt and pepper and it's um it's delicious. These are some other things that interest me. Um, I was lucky enough to see the solar eclipse a couple years ago, and uh, I remember as soon as it came on, like my friends just started screaming, and I've never like experienced that much joy in any one moment. Um, I'm actually pretty envious of uh, the two classmates of ours that are from Argentina because it'll cover Argentina this, uh, their winter, our summer. Um, I'm also into literary fiction. So these are two books that I enjoyed recently. 
check it out. Especially if you're Asian American, I think chemistry is like a required read. Um, and I put Elizabeth Warren up here because I'm a bit of an Elizabeth Warren bro. Uh, and I think some of her like ideas that she's advancing around um, technology in particular are really compelling. Uh, and I would love to see in my lifetime the big tech companies broken up. Um, oh, and I guess this Gen Z graphic, um, I think Gen Z is maybe the most interesting generation, and maybe that's just because they're the latest one. Um, but part of my job was to like study them and to like try and figure out their behaviors. Uh, and so I, I think they're pretty cool. Um, so prior to coming to SFPC, I was working at Snapchat for six years. Um, I started out on the engineering side, and these are three features that I had a major role in, um, leading the development of the back end in. Um, stories is these days pretty omnipresent, but um, the other two geo filters um, might not be as fami familiar to people. Geo filters are like these filters that you would get uh, when you were in specific locations. So we started out with neighborhoods. Um, eventually, they became more general purpose, um, maybe based on other signals like time of day, day of the week, et cetera. Um, this last one, shared stories, were a kind of evolution of stories, except instead of one person posting to a story, multiple people could post to the same story. And you would get this really cool compilation of things that were happening from a concert, an event, um, from all different perspectives. After three years on the engineering side, I um, moved to our design team. And um, this, at, on the design team, my focus was on what we call the preview screen. So I replicated it side by side on Snapchat and Instagram just because some people might not be familiar with Snapchat. But um, basically what happens after you take a photo or video and how do you make the content more compelling for people to, to share with their friends. Um, I was really interested in stickers, which are um, you know just sh small graphic images that you can put on to a photo or video and manipulate by hand. And I loved the fact that they were like so tactile and responded very appropriately and naturally to human input. Um, so you could pinch to resize them, drag them around with a finger. Um, so my first project was uh, what we called 3D stickers, or sometimes we call them two and a half D stickers because they weren't really 3D. Um, so these are just some examples of things people made with them. Um, the next project I did was um, our scissors tool, which allows people to make their own stickers and uh, augment their own snaps with things that were personal to them. Um, I'm interested in augmented reality generally, and this was uh, a project that we did to detect the context of a photo. And if you were taking a picture of a sky, um, you could then swipe over and replace the sky and change the foreground. Um, and the last thing I did, which is actually not really related to any of these um, interests, but is related to my political interests, was getting people to register to vote. Um, and so it's kind of just crazy to think about the scale that these companies operate, because all we did was add this little card to your profile, and we signed up 400,000 people in advance of last year's midterms um, for a demographic that young people that don't typically register to vote or vote. Um, Oh, sorry. But yeah, um, that's me. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Stefan Pelican. I seem to have accidentally deleted the title slide for myself. Um, this is my current website. It's the umpteenth iteration of A Million More to Come. And uh, yeah, there's some ambient information on there about myself. But my, so my my background is uh, is uh, <laughs> I, I graduated from Penn State University in 2018. I did a triple major in graphic design, art history, and German. And uh, I had the great privilege and uh, joy of working with Kelly Anderson as an intern two summers ago, which really informed how I think about design and sort of where I want to situate myself in it. 
so this is uh, some something I made just like fooling around one night a couple years ago. I just put it into Phil Space. Uh, this is a project from my undergrad called Fat Magazine, the paper issue. You notice I'll, I predated it for July 2020. Uh, we were given like a really god awful assignment to make a fashion magazine that was like a sort of cookie cutter copy of W Mag, and I couldn't help do a lot of research about uh high fashion as like an art form and i used this uh opportunity to really play with uh, a new medium in design like creating garments out of something that could be more malleable more uh customizable and also it felt like subversive because it was so uh unprecious you know paper um so yeah this this piece was called uh fat suit uh and i, I maybe there's an intentional um Facebook and Instagram shout out in the F and the at, but yeah. So the, the, here's uh, a few more stills from that <laughs> stills from that uh, that magazine. Uh, I, I assembled the whole thing w with um, you know taped together, torn paper, typewritten text, etc. Um, this uh, was some more. Uh, th this is an asset for that magazine. Uh, and, and, that, that that was actually un, unintended, but um, yeah. Uh, so th th these are um, a, many butts from across uh, corporate media and art history uh, that I assembled into sort of a jeweled, uh, like an inlay design that then um, f informed this spread. Uh, on the left, it's every display font from Google Fonts. Uh, use, and I used my, one of my first scripts ever to randomize the position in Adobe Illustrator. And then on the right, it's all the butts. So it's butts and butts. Uh, and then that um, <clears throat> formed the basis of this uh, spread. So the, the idea of the magazine was that for each garment, there was a fold out that had a different, it was sort of like riffing on, you know, my baby is, was the centerfold kind of deal. Like, uh, so here we've got, two rams, one wearing the headbutt garment, or sorry, well, I just gave away the punchline, uh, one wearing the, the butt, however, garment, one wearing the butts garment, uh, and they are headbutting. And actually, if you look in here, you'll see that there's butt head from Beavis and Butthead, and then the other one is leaving a trail of peach emojis behind it. Uh, so um, one thing I did discover in that process was I really enjoyed engaging with materials uh, you know, moving design into something that I could play with with my hands. And I also really liked research and gathering, you know, random screenshots and stuff. Uh, so in my fifth year of undergrad, I took it upon myself to do an independent study uh, thesis project that culminated in this book, which originally was called At Marathon, uh, which was a very uh, pretentious Greek uh, myth reference, but I'm really happy I changed the name to the Matrix Magnates. Uh, I'd love to talk about this with anyone later. It's, it goes from the Linotype machine, which was uh, a physical automation device, uh, basically allowed newspapers to go from being six to eight pages to you know 40 to 100 pages uh, by replacing handset type around the year 1887. Uh, wow, I didn't realize this video had sound. Uh, but um, the, the spreads are collaged together from like, primary source texts, and then uh, there's a vellum overlay with the Chicago citation and uh, references. Cool. Uh, so I, I will hurry up. Uh, here's another website I made for some drawing workshops that I'd love to speak with you about. Uh, yeah, um, pedagogy and history and um, interactivity are really important to me. Uh, some package design that's just like classy, I guess. Uh, I, I'm, uh, but yeah, uh, so at, here at SFPC, I'd really like to explore um, how design and collage and uh, research can be aided uh, for everyone using technology. Uh, here's my uh, email my Instagram, and I'd like to thank you all for your time and for the opportunity to be here. Um, hi, everyone. Um, 
I'm Steffi and um, I'm from Germany. I grew up in Bielefeld. It's a city that doesn't exist according to the first conspiracy theory of the internet um, from Usenet times. So that was a while ago. And as a kid, I had a book which was called um, The Magic of MC Escher. Uh, and it contains a lot of mathematical drawings and also information on how these drawings are being constructed. And in school, I liked both science and art, but I didn't know any art students. And um, I hang out with computer science students in the university to uh, use their accounts to sneak on the internet. And my 14th birthday was my first birthday on the internet. And then I studied um, applied computer science in the natural sciences, and I worked on the folding of RNA molecules. Um, these molecules are single-stranded molecules and they fold back onto themselves to form base pairings. And in my PhD thesis, I compared these molecules by their structure in the 2D plane. So it's a little bit like you see it here. This is a game where you can um, yeah, help in the folding because the space of possibilities to fold such a molecule is so big that sometimes we need human help. And um, RNA secondary structures are uh, represented as trees in the computer and are described by recursive tree grammars. I really like trees and recursion. <laughs> and um, also, my friends and I participated in the Nokia Push N900 project uh, where we connected a real skateboard um, to this uh, Nokia N900 smartphone, really cool phone. You can slide out the keyboard. I liked it a lot. And um, we made some custom hardware that fits inside the skateboard truck actually and the batteries inside the truck so uh, it's a bit like this tony hawk game but on the street you can really uh, use the skateboard and it will record some tricks and the game on the phone will like give you some points um and then in the university i was also thinking a lot about how we teach programming why are there so many examples constructing cars I ride a bicycle and I don't relate. <laughs> Everybody eats though. So two friends and I, we made a book teaching functional programming uh, with curry cooking, uh, with recipes in each chapter. <laughs> and then um, while waiting for my grades, we made some giant whips called the knit whips uh, at Burning Man with 14 friends from Montreal. And they are higher than a human, actually. You can see there we are in the blurry picture. And one person has to shake it. And then with this persistence of vision effect, you can write a message into the sky. And um, it only lasted three days because people climbed it and then it broke. But it was great while it lasted, I think. Mm. And then um, after my postdoc, uh, in Montreal, I started working at Etsy uh, here in New York. It's an online marketplace for handmade goods. I moved to New York and I worked on the search uh, infrastructure team, but then the election happened and I moved back to Berlin after that. And uh, there I started to work on a really small decentralized operating system. It's called Mirage OS. And then I also made this really cool fractal viewer. I have no idea what to t tell you about it, but I think it's really fun. And you can zoom into the fractal and try it out on my website. Um, and then uh, back in Berlin, what do I do there? I'm part of uh, the Heart of Code. The Heart of Code is a feminist hack space for everyone who identifies as a woman. And there I run the security hacks group <laughs> where we teach ourselves cryptography. And uh, we use a really fun problem set. So every time you decipher something, you get some rap lyrics. <laughs> and um, what I would like to explore in the school, hmm, that's really difficult because I come from engineering. I feel like I'm, I think like an engineer and I would like to change that. And I feel it's already happening. My brain is rewiring. I want to learn how to think better like an artist. And another thing that's really important to me is I feel there's pain in my family tree. My grandmother went to the gulag. She worked in the mine when she was 14 years old and she lost all her teeth. My mom inherited some of the history of this pain and I would like to refuse to pass this pain on. Um, I see this as like some sort of recursion over the generations, and I would like it to stop. I'm the base case of this recursion. 
And I feel like I share this experience with many of my friends, even though their history might be a bit different and they are of Jewish or Chinese origin. But I feel we are in this pain together and we can heal it together by making connections. I believe in mutual aid. And um, with my projects, I'm trying to empower and connect people. So a lot of the projects, they, they don't work alone. A lot of the interfaces, they don't work alone. Somebody has to shake that pole and I have to walk a bit backwards to see it, right? I like this because we live in a world where everybody's actions are interconnected and we can learn from each other's experiences. I think there is more than one reality and I would like to try your reality out and try it on. Uh, hi guys, my name is Vivian. I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, some background about me, I studied interior architecture. Um, university was really art focused and explorative, um, which is probably where I got my interest in technology um, because I was running away from architecture. Um, so when I entered the workforce, it was not uh, very good. Um, it made me quite sad. Um, so I started ceramics to alleviate stress. Um, and I loved it so much that I quit, it, I quit my job um, and I got a studio. Um, so some things I like, um, I've always been interested in image making and scene rendering. Um, I'm really interested in the way that we see things and transmit our ideas um, and the interaction that we have with ourselves um, online. Um, I'm food obsessed. I really like um, sci-fi and aliens. Um, and so I started documenting thoughts like this. Um, from that, I got invited to my first show. Um, this is probably um, most representative of me. Um, uh, the show was called Weird Snack, um, and it was about unconventional ways of enjoying food. Um, does anyone know about cheese dreams? Oh, like dreams of the rabbit themed? I don't know. Um, yes. <laughs> Um, I found out about cheese dreams and I became obsessed with it. Um, basically, if you eat a piece of cheese before you go to bed, you'll get a really weird dream. Like, it, like <laughs> someone did a study on it, one person did a study on it, and that's all I could find. So I decided to study it myself. Um, this left side shows uh, people submit their stories and experiences with drugs. Um, someone submitted a cheese drug. Um, <laughs> Um, so on the other side, I guess I, for about nine months, I ate uh, different cheeses <laughs> uh, according to their country of origin, um, animal of origin, uh, different firmnesses. Um, and I monitored my sleep and sort of looked at the correlation between my cheese dreams and the type of cheese I was eating. Um, so I made a zine about it. Um, I can talk to you about it if you want. Um, I also made some ceramics. Um, so this is a bedside platter with, with a, like a little nightlight so you can take your cheese with you um, <laughs> before you go to sleep. Um, and the other one is a, like a little cheese toothbrush holder so you eat your cheese and you brush your teeth straight away and go to bed. Um, so since then I've become really interested in ceramics. Um, I was learning a lot about glaze chemistry um, and the way clay behaves. Um, but I'm always trying to sort of, there's this other part of my practice where I'm looking at the way I'm interacting with it online um, and how it sort of relates to all of my other interests. Um, the objects I was making was just meant to be the subject of my documentation, um, but it sort of just took over. Um, so I, I've just been making a lot of sculptures. Um, sometimes it, it's mostly to do with the, the object. Um, and sometimes it's to do with the scene um, and the relationship that the things I'm making have with me um, and the way I see the world. Um, yeah, so this is the last thing that I made in Melbourne. Um, I'm sort of exploring a process. I'm interested in the gaze, um, our personal machine gaze um, and alien worlds. Um, and I've sort of been doing these two exercises and wondering which one's Im uh, more important or more interesting to me. Um, so this is sort of sums up where I'm at at the moment. Um, this is my grandma's hand uh, on the Christmas dinner table. Um, 
she's put this plate with a piece of paper on the table and it's specifically for holding one banana. Um, and I guess she's offering her banana in our shrine. Um, and I always found these shrines really funny because they're sort of just on a fold out dining table in our living room. Um, so I'm interested in, in object making, um, what these objects are made for, what else they can do, what they look like, um, where we put them or where we find them. Um, the relationship between people, objects, environment, culture, and display. And this second image is sort of why I'm here. Um, there's a part of my practice I've been wanting to work on where I'm really lacking uh, knowledge and community. So um, the way I've been dealing with it looks like this pot. Um, and to my classmates, I would just say, um, I would love to work and collaborate with you all in making that pot. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, so that's, that's it. And um, just want to say thanks to a few people, um, especially the alumni who are here. Um, we're really happy to see you. And then um, we have a few special guests today. First of all, my parents are here. Raise your hand. <laughs> Mom and dad. <laughs> They're visiting from South Korea for a few weeks. So it happens that this happens. So please say hi to them. And I think Sarah's mom is also here. Hi, Sarah's mom. <laughs> Anyone else's parents here? My dad is watching the live stream. Alex's dad is watching live stream. So yeah, all the dads and moms and friends in live stream. So we'll welcome to see you. And then um, uh, thanks so much. And um, yeah, let's hang out. And um, I think other special friends are Laura is visiting from Argentina. She's a filmmaker and VR educator. You should talk to Laura. Um, she's over there. And then Kanta and then the whole team is from Tokyo and they're doing educational projects with technology and other kind of new projects. So there are a lot of friends here. So um, we're happy to have you here. Thank you.